All right, ladies and gentlemen, what's going on? This your girl Tiffany. I'm coming through right here live in effect. So today's topic will be about Rebecca Davis Lee Crumper. All right. And if you guys like the channel and you like the contents that I post, please make sure you hit the notification bell, subscribe to the channel, and share this YouTube channel. And also, yeah. Also, yeah, share the YouTube channel, whatnot, subscribe, and all that great stuff. Anyways, today's Black History topic is going to be about Rebecca Davis Lee Crumpler, who was an African-American physician, the first woman to be an African-American physician at that. And also, she was an author. So, I'm going to show an image. I believe this is the picture of her. I'm not exactly sure. But I believe this is the picture of Rebecca Davis Lee Crumper. I could be wrong. All right. So let's go ahead and let's look at the biography. And I have many other sources to back it up as well. All right, so if you go on the Wiki One website, you will find out information. All right, so according to the website, Rebecca Lee Crumpler, and here's the in introduction she was born as Rebecca Davis, and she was an American physician and author. All right, she was born on February the 8th, 1831, and she died on March the 9th, 1895. All right. After studying at the New England Female Medical College in 1864, she became the first African-American woman to become a doctor of medicine in the United States. All right. Crumpler was one of the first female physician authors in the 19th century. In 1883, she published a book of medical discourses. The book has two parts that cover the prevention and cure of infertile bowel complaints and the light and the life and growth of human beings. Dedicated to nurses and mothers, it focuses on maternal and pediatric medical care and was among the first publications written by an African-American about medicine. Okay. Crumpler graduated from medical co college at a time when very few African-Americans were allowed to attend medical college and publish books. Crumpler first practiced medicine in Boston, primarily serving poor women and children. After the American Civil War ended in 1865, she moved to Richmond, Virginia, believing treating women and children was an ideal way to perform missionary work. Crumpler worked for Freeman's Bureau to provide medical care for, for free slaves. And she was subject to intense racism and sexism while practicing medicine. During this time, many men believed that a man's brain was 10% bigger than a woman's brain on average. And that's a woman's job, and that a woman's job was to act submissively and be beautiful. Because of this, many male physicians did not respect Rebecca Lee Crumpler and would not approve her prescriptions for patients or listen to her medical opinions. Still, Rebecca Lee Crumpler preserved and worked passionately. She later moved back to Boston to continue to treat women and children. The Rebecca Lee Pre-Health Society at Syracuse University and the Rebecca Lee Society, one of the first medical society for African-American women, were named after her. Her Joy Street House is a stop on the Boston Women's Heritage Trail. Okay. So now let's look at her early life. Where was she born? Okay, so it says she was born in Christiana, Delaware, to Matilda Weber and Absalom Davis. And she was raised in Pennsylvania by her aunt who cared for ill towns people. Her aunt acted as the doctor in her community and had a huge influence on her. She was inspired by her aunt after seeing that she was the one to go to when people got sick. She moved to Charleston. Charlestown, Massachusetts in 1852, where she worked as a nurse before applying and becoming accepted in the New England Female Medical College. 
Rebecca Lee Crumpler was the only African-American woman who attended the school at the time. All right, so we're going to go down to here. So, of course, it says from 1855, 1864, Carpola was employed as a nurse. She was accepted into New England Female Medical College in 1860. This school was founded by Dr. Israel Tisdale Tabat and Samuel Gregory. She won a tuition award from the Wake Scholarship Fund, established by a bequest from local businessman John Wade of Woodburn. It was rare for women or black men to be admitted to medical schools during this time in 1860 due to the heavy demands of medical care for Civil War veterans. There were more opportunities for women physicians and doctors due to her talent. Crumpler was given a recommendation to attend to the school by her supervising physician when she was a medical apprentice. That year, there were 54,543 physicians in the United States, 300 of whom were women. None of them were African-American, making Rebecca Lee Crumpler the first and only African-American physician in her class. All right, so this is the college she attended to. All right, it's a sketch. But that was the college she went to, the university. Okay. And then it says she graduated from the school in 1864 after having completed three years course in a thesis, a thesis in a final oral examination in February 1864. On March the 1st, 1864, the board, the board of trustees named her a doctor of medicine. Married to White Lee at that time, she was identified as Mrs. Rebecca Lee by the school where she was the only African-American graduate. She was the country's first African-American woman to become a formally trained physician. All right. So after the end of the Civil War, American Civil War, she moved to Richmond, Virginia, believing it to be an ideal way to provide missionary service, as well as to gain more experience learning about diseases that affected women and children. She said of that time, during my stay there, nearly every hour was improved in that sphere of labor. A labor. The last quarter of the year, 1866, I was enabled to have access each day to a very large number of indigent and other of different classes in a popul population over 30,000 colored. So at Freeman's Bureau, she worked under the assistant commissioner, Orlando Brown. Subject to intense racism by both the administration and other physicians, she had difficulty getting prescription filled and was ignored by white, I mean, by male physicians. She, she, some people heckled at the MD behind her name, stood for more driver. Rebecca knew that being the first African-American woman in this field would be challenging, but she had resilience and overcame this adversity. All right, so she had moved to 67 Joy Street in Boston, a predominantly African-American community street in Bacon Hill. She practiced medicine and treated children without concern for parents' ability to pay. Her house is on the Boston Women's Heritage Trail. All right, so let's go ahead and skip down. To where she published her first book, which is called A Book of Medical Discourses. So in 1883, Crumpler published a book of medical discourses from the notes she kept over the course of her medical career. Dedicated to the nurses and mothers, it focused on the medical career of women and children. Her main desire in presenting this book was to emphasize the possibility of prevention. Therefore, she recommended that women should study the mechanism of human structure before becoming a nurse in order to better enable themselves to protect life. However, Crumpler stated that most nurses did not agree with this and tended to forget that every alignment there was a cause and it was within their power to remove it. Although her primary focus was on the health of women and children, which seemed to be influenced by homopathy, Crumpler re recommended courses 
of treatment without without stating that the treatment was homopathy. She did not mention that medicine could be harmful, but stated the conventional amount of standard medicine usage. Her medical book is divided in two sessions. In the first part, she focus, focuses on preventing and mod was it mit mitigating intestinal problems that can occur around the teething period until the child is about five years of age. The second part of yeah, the second part mainly focused on the following areas, life and growth of beings, the beginning of womanhood and the provision and the cure of the most distressing complaints of both sexes. Although the book was focused on medical advice, Crumpler also ties in autobiographical details that contain political, social, and moral commentary. Specifically in the first chapter, Crumpler gave non-medical advice concerning her thoughts on what age and how a woman should enter into marriage. The chapter also contained advice for both men and women on how to ensure a happy marriage. Crumpler described the progression of experience that led to her study and practice medicine in her book. So before I go there, let's look at homopathy. Now, what is homopathy? Oh, homopathy is a pseudoscientific scientific system of alternative medicine. It's con it was conceived in 1796 by the German physician Samuel Hahnemann. Its practitioner called homopaths believe that a substance that causes symptoms of a disease in healthy people can cure similar symptoms in sick people. This, this doctrine is called simula syllabus carentur or light cures like homopathic preparation are terms are term remedies and are may use homopathic dilution in this process the selected substance is repeatedly diluted until the final product is chemically indistinguishable from the from the dilute often not even a single molecule of the original substance can be expected to remain in the product between each dilution, homopaths may hit and or shake the product, claiming this makes the dilute remember the original substance after its removal. Petitioner claimed that such preparation upon oral intake can treat or cure disease. All right. So. It also goes on to say all relevant scientific knowledge about physics, chemistry, biochemistry, and biology gained since at least the mid-19th century contradicts homopathy. Homopathic remedies are biochemically in inert and have no effect on any known disease. Hanneman's theory of disease center around principle he termed my myism is inconsistent with subsequent identification of viruses and bacteria as cause of disease. C clinical trials have been con conducted and generally demonstrate no objective effect of, from homopathic preparation. The fundamental impossibility of homopathy as well as a lack of demonstrable effectiveness has led to its being characterized within the scientific and medical communities as crackery and fraud. Okay. So therefore, at that time she used homopathy. Now, as of today, homopathy is considered pseudoscience because it's lacking evidence, scientific evidence, to actually prove that it works as far as the remedies is concerned. Does it work for a certain type of disease or viruses or whatnot? So it goes off the notion I did that hey if these people over here that's healthy, if they take this and it doesn't do anything wrong to them, then it would also help those over here who's sick and it will make them feel better. So it was no scientific evidence. It was no scientific research to actually prove or um, to support such claims. So that's why it's considered as pseudoscientific. All right. But as of today, it's still the concept of the homopathy is still being used, especially within the conscious community, um, 
especially when we talk about certain holistic healers or those who claim themselves to be, they use the concept of homopathy and say that, hey, these are natural remedies and they they swear up and down that they have um they have used these remedies to cure people and to help people to um they have patients who um went through these things various type of disease and now they no longer deal with them etc so with that being the case it's very misleading it could be very misleading but again you know there's still people who still go along with that and i'm give a prime example the late dr sabi Dr. Sabi used a lot of homopathy. I mean, there was some information that was very valuable, especially when it comes to like dietary stuff, as far as eating right and making sure that you balance in good meal and whatnot. But when he started talking about how he cured AIDS and uh, herpes and all other disease, then that's when it became fraudulent because he had no way of exactly proving that that's what he did. But people to this day still believe that his remedies did cure AIDS and in fact cure herpes, which are very serious viruses. And when you have those viruses, they're not going to go anywhere. They stay with you for a long period of time. So anybody that knows about viruses, they don't go anywhere. They just mutate means that they change over time. That's all, all it is. All right. So let me go back to the source. Okay. All right. So that's the definition of homopathy. All right. So it's a, so it's considered as pseudoscientific and supposed to be the alternatives to medicine. All right. All right. So yeah, that's why you gotta be careful when you go to these um herbal stores or these herbal places that you know. And when you talk to certain individuals who work there and they tell you, hey, you need to take these herbs right here because this herb will do this, they ain't other. I recommend people to read on the back of the bottle and see where if it has been FDA approved. And also to um, look at the uh, side effects, the causes of it. Because if you guys don't look at the side effects, then you might take something and then you will end up being sick. You know what I'm saying? So you always want to look to see if there's any side effects that will be taking place and if it's FDA approved. So that way you won't put yourself at risk or you won't be in jeopardy because you done took some type of herbal medicine. You know. Yep. All right, let's go ahead and continue. All right, so down here it says, it may be well to state here that having been reared by a kind of aunt in Pennsylvania who you whose usefulness with the sick was continually sought, I early conceived a liking for and sought every opportunity to relieve the sufferings of others. Later in life, I devote my time when, when best I could to nursing as a a business serving under different doctors for a period of eight years most of the time at my adopted home in charleston middlesex county massachusetts from these doctors i received letters commanding me to the faculty of the new england female medical college whence four years afterwards i received a degree of doctorate of medicine It says, at the time, writings and books by African-American authors had prefaces and introduction written in the style of white male writings to give them authentication. Crumpler was able to introduce her own text and was able to justify her work based on her own authority. All right. So down here is her personal life. She was married to Watts Lee a Virginian native and former slave. They were married on April the 19th, 1852. This was Watts second and her first marriage. A year later, Watts son, Albert died at age seven. This tragedy may have motivated Rebecca to begin her study of nursing for the next eight years. Rebecca was still a medical student when her husband died of tuberculosis on 
April 18th, 1863. He is buried at Mount Hope Cemetery in Boston. All right. So um, tuber tuberculosis was a very um, common disease back then in the African-American community. So it was the most deadly disease at that time. So if you end up having tuberculosis, the chances was that you were going to end up dying because that disease was a very, uh, it was a serious, it was a serious disease that caused many deaths in the black community. Um, so as of today, like we dealing with the coronavirus, the coronavirus is killing a lot of people at this point. So yeah, it's a very silent disease. That's how tuberculosis is. It's very silent. And it's a solid killer. Somebody put, looking up side effects is important. Absolutely, it is. It's always important to know about the side effects. So that way you'll know that, okay, if is it safe for me to take this medicine? Is it safe for me to do this? Is it safe for me to inject this? Because if it's not safe, and if it's got some type of serious side effect to it, then you might want to reconsider that. But if the side effect is not as bad and you feel like you're on the safe side, then you can go for that. But yeah, always consider that. Okay. You say it may not always be re reliable, but it's still a part of the testing program i mean you still would have to go through the administration especially when you're trying to pre prescribe something to an individual as far as like medical wise you still have to like go through that process through those procedures to get it exam and go through it to get it tested and whatnot so that way it could be safe to put on the market and many people who have these herbal medicine they don't go through those process of getting these things um tested or examine before they put on the market. So they just put them out there on the market and then people don't know what the hell they dealing with or what they taking. You know what I'm saying? They have no idea. Uh, what else I wanted to say? There was something else on my mind. Yeah, also, another thing too, they supposed to put on there, like when you look at the bottles, it's supposed to say, okay, this product is not to treat or to cure or to prevent any type of disease, etc. If it doesn't say that on there, then you need to start asking some questions. And if it does say that on there and you got a certain type of disease, then you don't need to take it. You know what I'm saying? You, your best way is to go to a physician and go to the doctors and, you know, get the proper medicine that you really need. So that's another thing I wanted to throw in out there, but I didn't think about that until just now. Yeah. Um... Let me let me go ahead and scroll on down. So Dr. Rebecca Lee married Arthur Crumbler in St. John, New Brunswick on May the 24th, 1865. Arthur was a former fugitive slave from South Hampton County, Virginia. All right. And this is him right here. This was her husband, her second husband. Okay, that's her second husband. Born in 1824, he was the son of Samuel Crumpler, a slave of Benjamin Crumpler. Arthur lived on the neighborhood, neighboring estate of a large landowner, Robert Adams, with his mother and sibling. When Adam died, his family was sold and nine-year-old Arthur was killed by Robert Adams' son, John Adams of Smithfield, Virginia, after Arthur won a wrestling contest with John on the day of the estate auction. Except for one sister, he never found out the whereabouts of the people who purchased his family members. He served with the Union Army at Fort Moreau, Virginia, as a blacksmith. Based upon his training and experience, he went to Massachusetts in 1865 and was taken in by Nathaniel Adam founder of the West Newton English and Classical School called the Allen School on Jan July 
the 16th of 2020, a ceremony was held at Fairview Cemetery to dedicate a gravestone in the memory of Rebecca Lee Crumpler and her husband, Arthur. The, gra the granite stone was the result of a fundraising appeal spearheaded by Vicki Gow, a, a history buff and president of the Friends of the Hyde Park Library. All right. All right, so it goes on to say, Crumpler spoke at a service of Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner upon his death in 1874. She read a poem that she had written for him, where she touchily alluded to his love for the gifted Emerson. By 1880, the Crumplers moved to Hyde Park, Boston. Although no photographs or other image of Crumpler survived, a Boston Globe article described her as a very pleasant and intellectual woman and in in the in the fatigable church worker. Dr. Crumpler is 59 or 60 years of age, tall and straight, with long brown skin, with light brown skin and gray hair. About marriage, she said the secret of a successful marriage is to continue in the careful routine of the courting days till it becomes well understood between the two. Rebecca Crumbler died on March the 9th, 1895 in Fairview, Massachusetts, while still residing in Hyde Park. She and her husband, Arthur, are both buried at the nearby Fairview Cemetery. Arthur died in May of 1910. She and her husband were buried in unmarked graves for 125 years until July 16th of 2020. Donations were collected through a fundraiser to create gravestones for the couple and a ceremony was held at Fairview Cemetery as a gravestone finally was install marketing where she and her husband are buried all right then now let's look at legacy the legacy the legacy is the rebecca lee society one of the first medical societies for african-american women were na was named in her honor her home on joy street is a non-stop on the boston women harris trail i read that before okay so in 2009 virginia governor ralph northam declared March the 30th, National Doctors Day, the Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumbler Day. At Syracuse University, there is a pre-health club named the Rebecca Lee Pre-Health Club. This club encourages people of diverse backgrounds to pursue health profession. They offer men mentors, workshops, and resources to help members succeed. Rebecca Lee Crumpler and her husband, Arthur Crumpler, also received new Grand Knight's headstones to celebrate her achievement of being a pioneer physician who earned her medical degree in Boston. All right, so you can see also here, and there's further readings. It says, female medical college of 100 years ago had two professions and not even a skeleton. All right, so now here's the notes. All right. And then here's the reference at the very bottom. So if you guys want to check more out, you can. Now, here it is. Under the notes, it says the school that she attended to, where she graduated from, the school in 1873, due to financial issues without graduate, I mean, closed without graduating another black woman. The great need for a medical provider encouraged other black people to join the medical profession. Black charitable organization and white missionary organization provided fund funding for the first black med medical schools. All right. Okay. Um 
let's go ahead and let's look at another information, another source real fast. All right, so if you also want to look more into Rebecca Lee Crumbler, you can also check out blackpass.org. See, there it goes, blackpass.org. Let's see what they're talking about here. So here it is. Here's the information. I pretty much then said the same thing that I have read. So, you know, it's just a shorter. And so where did the source of information come from? So the, the website they got this information from is the American National Biography Online. The, Amer the American National Biography Online, which was written by Sarah K.A. Fatak. But Tess or I don't know how you say her last name, Rebecca Davis Lee Crumpler. All right. And the website comes from www.pbs.org. Okay. So, but here's blackpass.org. You can find all kinds of information that you have a desire to look for. Okay. All right, let's see what else I want to show you all. So, of course, the main website that I always recommend people to go to. All right, so here it is, another information about her in this book. And the name of the book is Do 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 The African American Who Were First. By John Potter and Constant Clayter. All right, illustrated with photographs. Okay. So let's see how long ago this book was written. This book was written in 1997. But again, you can check it out. So you can go on archive.org and just check out the books. Um Yeah, you can do all that. You can check the book out. You can um, you can borrow the book. You can rent the book. You can buy the book online. All that good stuff. All right. So archive.org is the best website to go to. So if you want to look for anything that's PDF, ebook, you can go to this website. Okay. All right. Then you can also check out, I don't know if you guys can see me. All right. Then you guys can also check out um, see it. You can check this page out, which comes from it comes from www.pbs.org. But the website I got it from is deepblue.library. Uh, I guess it's University of Michigan.edu. So and it says PBS News Hour celebrating Rebecca Lee Crumbler, first African American woman physician. Okay. All right. So, oh, this is nice. They got like a little coin right here on the right hand side. Oh, how cool. Let's see what else we gonna find in this information. I'm trying to see what information I will find on here. Hmm. Well, it basically does say the same thing that. Pretty much the same thing I read is also written in this article as well. So, um, just so it's basically to verify the source. That's all. Um, as far as the book, I couldn't find any information on the book. So, 
the book might be outdated. So it's probably going to be extremely hard to find it. But this is the title of the book right here. A book, Medical Discourse in Two Parts, which was written by her in 1883. Okay. All right, then. So this is the article. And it's pretty much saying exactly the same thing that Wikipedia was saying. So you guys can look it up for yourself. All right. You know, you always want to bet, you know, double check, verify the source and all that great stuff. All right, then. Um, do, 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 do. Somebody put, you have to have an official job. You have to go through the process of certification. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, you do. Because people lives is dependent upon it. And if you make any type of medical mistake or if you giving them any type of drug and they eventually have some type of serious side effect that they can't recover from or they end up dying, then it's going to cost you. So, yes. So, you're right. Absolutely. Yes, you got to go through that certification process. And that's that. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So this your girl Tiffany, and I am going to end the video for today. But thank you all for tuning in, watching, and make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell, make sure you share the channel, and also um support this channel. As you can see, there's my Cash App information. So if you want to give like some type of um, you know. If you want to donate or if you want to, you know what I'm saying, if you want to uh, send some type of appreciation, you can do so. That's the cash app at the bottom of the screen. But please, you know, make sure you guys support the channel. Make sure you share the channel. Hit the notification bell. Uh, like the channel. Share the videos. All the great stuff. And I have more contents on there as well that pertains to a lot of black history. So you guys can share the video. And I thank you guys I thank those of you who have been subscribing and shout out to my you new to shout out to my new YouTube subscriber. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate that a lot. And make sure you guys check out Team Osiris. They doing their thing. Team Osiris, that is O S I R I S Team Osiris. All right, check them out. They doing big things. Uh, you can check out Brother Kofi Pazai TV. Also, check out New Black Knowledge. They always post up information about black history and all that great stuff. Any information that you need to know about history, right, especially black history, they have a lot of great content on their channel as well. So please make sure you guys check them out, all right? So until then, I will reconnect with you all later, all right? Take it easy on yourself. May peace and power elevation be to all of you, and I thank you guys so much. All right. Have a good day.